Welcome everybody to Still a Part of Us. I am Winter. I'm the one of the hosts of this show and um, we're going to be talking with Angelica a little bit about her experience um, with the stillbirth of her son, Ezra. A couple of things before we get started, just housekeeping things. This conversation is full of triggers. So if you are not in a good place, please do not listen, do not watch. Um, we want to be as helpful as possible. And if you're not in a good place, please just be aware that we will be talking about a lot of different things that could be hard to listen to. So please just be aware of that. And if you are part of our community, if you are a lost mom, lost dad, hit the subscribe button. We are here to help build community. So please join us and, and help each other out. Once again, Angelica, thank you so much for coming on and chatting with us about Ezra. If you did not get a chance to hear her birth story, you will cry um, because I did. Please check that birth story out. Angelica, thank you once again for coming on today and discussing some things that have helped you and have not helped you. So welcome once again. Thank you so much. And thank you for, again, wanting to hear my son's story. Oh, it's yeah. so wonderful to be able to tell it. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. Tell us again, just so that everybody is kind of brought up to speed, how long ago was Ezra born? He was born on June 1st of 2020. So at the time of this recording, it's been just about 10 months or so. So still very new, still very raw. And I'm going to just be like that first birthday coming up is that that can be that that's going to be a milestone that can be a little tricky. So and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. And also just to a little bit of context, Ezra was stillborn at 33 weeks so that everybody knows wh where we're coming from. So um, Angelica, tell me how it's been these last 10 months for you. How has your grief been? How have you approached it, I guess? And how have you dealt with it? Well, to, to start with, it was really, it was really rough and dark. It just felt, everything just felt so dark. In those first couple of weeks, I think I was actually so despondent that my husband was concerned that I would do something drastic. That's what he told me. Um, and I'd done talk therapy before, but he looked at me and he said, if you're willing to do it this early, you know, I, I really think you should. And so I, I did start to go to counseling in the first two to three weeks mm -hmm. following Ezra's death. And, you know, and that did help, that did help quite a bit. And I went about twice a week for several months and then eventually down to once a week. For several months and now it's kind of been titrated to about once a month for the past two weeks or two weeks excuse me two months or so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it sounds like it has been somewhat helpful yes yeah it, I found that it was really helpful for me to talk about him mm -hmm. and to talk about what happened I just I didn't realize how much it, it would be helpful to talk about him because there are so many other instances where I've met parents who just they don't want to talk about what happened at all. Mm -hmm. They kind of want to they want to sweep it under the rug for the moment and just you know and just kind of move forward. And I I thought to myself, am I doing this wrong? Because I feel like I I want to talk about him more. Or am I part of too many? support groups, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't actually start going to support groups until about two months after. And it started with local support groups. Yeah. Um, but I found another another organization. It's called the Star Legacy Foundation. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. which, which I imagine somebody has to have mentioned yeah. once before on here. But uh, they did a, they had a, a physician who was doing a seminar on, um, on umbilical cords and because we don't really know what happened to us or I thought well maybe maybe he's got information that will give me an aha moment I see and I can talk to my doctor about it and see if that could have been part of what happened and then from there found the support groups on there great it makes a huge difference when you are sitting with somebody that has had a very similar experience to you and not have to kind of explain all those feelings that you have and if they've never experienced before, because you mentioned it before in your birth episode, 
your background is a, as a NICU nurse, a neonatal intensive care unit nurse. And so you've always had that idea that there's a possibility, right? You've seen people have lost before, but you said something that struck a chord with me where you said, I had, I had no idea, even though I understood it until you actually have felt the loss yourself. It's, um, it's totally different, right? It's, it really is. Because in report, when we're talking about our patients, we talk about their moms. We talk about their birth history. Mm-hmm. And that that includes mom's birth history as well. Mm-hmm. So if if parents have had a previous loss, then we generally know about those. And any time that you hear about somebody who's had previous losses, it just, before losing Esther, it would just it would make my heart sink. But now... I, it makes me, it makes me weak at the knees just thinking about what that person is going through. So yeah, it, what other people have the ability to imagine doesn't even touch the actual experience, regardless of how much they've worked on it, how much they try to understand it. And I'm grateful for that. I am so grateful <laughs> that there are people out there who, who try, who, who work with with those who have lost, but who've never experienced that loss themselves. Yeah. I think, I think that's, I'm grateful that they haven't been through that themselves. Yeah. And, but are willing. Oh yeah. I was going to say, <laughs> shout out to my therapist. Same thing with her. She's, she's never experienced that kind of loss, but she has helped us so much. So yes, I completely yeah. agree with you. <laughs> then there are some people that are still doing wonderful things despite not having had that loss. Thank, thankfully not having that loss. So, um, mm-hmm. You have gone to see a therapist and, and also some of these group, these grief groups, um, that are, you can also, you can find them kind of online. You can meet electronically, I guess, (laughs) um, Mm -hmm. which is so, so nice, especially at this time when meetings like in-person meetings are not happening. I I believe my, my hospital, um, I don't think has any of those in-person meetings. It's all zoom right now anyway. So so yeah, that's us too. I think that the the pandemic has made this technology more accessible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and so I think for as awful as things have been over the last year, for for so many different reasons, obviously, you know, I think that aspect of things has has been it's been helpful. Yes, it's been really helpful to have the the access to those people electronically, virtually. Yeah. Virtually. Yes, it is. Yeah. It is a blessing. That's a a little silver lining of the pandemic, right? Um, and when you, obviously you had Ezra and he was, this was a big surprise, obviously not expected. You were 33 weeks. Were you allowed to take some time off to after his birth? Yes. Yes. And I originally Asked them just to allow me to take whatever I was allowed for maternity leave. Originally, I was approved for nine weeks off. Mm-hmm. And as I was getting to like the seven, eight week mark, I started to panic about thinking about going back to work. Yeah. Because I just didn't know if I, I didn't even know I could, if I could physically enter the hospital, let alone Onto walk your... those same halls. Yes. <laughs> you know, uh, go back into the unit where I was just hours before I was admitted yeah. and found out that he was gone. So I just, I didn't know. And so I petitioned for three more, which I had, you know, it was in with, within the policy to allow me to have that extra time. Right. But they were very gracious. So I was able to take 12 full weeks off and I needed every last day. Yeah. Great. That's great. And transitioning back to work, so you did. Did you go back to the to the NICU? Mm-hmm. Yeah, how, I did. How has that been? It's been a, a whirlwind. I started off the first week or so. Sorry, the first week or so, I um, I was with a fellow employee, one of my peers, almost like I was being oriented back onto the floor because I knew that if something happened 
I needed somebody who was going to be able to watch my assignment like right then and there. I wasn't going to be able to wait for somebody who could come and take over for me in 20 minutes when they were done with their assignment elsewhere. I just, I needed someone who could take over the reins and I knew that the kids were safe because my biggest concern was that I wasn't going to be a safe nurse, that I was going to be distracted. I see. And it started out in, in small increments. So I think I started out with four hour increments, went to eight, and then eventually worked my way back up to full 12. Right, right. I think that's, uh, and was that something that you kind of worked with your, worked out with your nurse manager to create something that kind of um, a schedule so that you could feel like you were easing back into things? Yeah, yeah, I did. I talked with my, my nurse manager. And they kind of worked out what types of assignments I should be taking as well, Mm -hmm. just to make sure that they weren't giving me little boys named Ezra (laughs) or 33 weekers, you know, just to kind of be sensitive about the the details um, surrounding Ezra's birth and, and helping me to come back just because you know, and I don't ask me why they want me back (laughs) because I don't feel like I'm, I feel pretty worthless as as a NICU nurse in day, but, um, but they've been very kind and they've been trying to, trying to help me to adjust back. Yeah. Yeah. Praises to your, I seriously, they have just to pay attention to, like you said, the details the fact that they're like, if this patient is a, like a 33 worker, uh, this baby is a 33 week or that is, that's those little things that can be triggering. And the fact mm-hmm. that they are paying attention is, is cool. Like that is very sensitive and cool of them to do that or to be aware of it's that. Amazing. Yeah. My coworkers have been amazing. And actually, so because he was born early mm-hmm. or because we delivered early, I didn't have those extra weeks of PTO built up. Mm, mm -hmm. And so I think I was able to cover seven weeks of PTO on my own. All the rest of it was PTO donation from my coworkers. That is awesome. That is so kind. They they fed and clothed clothed my family and kept the lights on (laughs) for five weeks. I just... It's hard to know how to say thank you to them yeah. for that. Yeah. That's really great. I think that's good job, coworkers. <laughs> <laughs> amazing. Just amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Now you're back up to like full time shifts and, and how is it how's that been? Are you doing are you how's that? Are you looking are you doing okay? Like I just I can't imagine honestly working on the NICU. So I just like, <laughs> oh, oh yeah. I'm I'm actually not working full time. I'm point six. Oh, so okay. I'm working two days a week. Okay. And that was that was always the plan. Oh. That was always the plan for us for me to go to point six after Ezra was born because our intent was for me to be able to spend more time with the kids and then to kind of minimize the amount of, of child care we yes. would need. Yes, for sure. But after Ezra passed, I just thought to myself, I don't know that I can force myself to be on the floor any longer than that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just because um as you probably know, you spend all of your days off just accruing as much energy as you can so that you can be functional and have your hat on straight. And I I feel like those two days at work every week, they take every ounce of energy that I have collected over, you know, a couple of days at a time off off of work. Yeah. (laughs) That is a great way of putting it. <laughs> you do need to store it up <laughs> to, yeah, to, to be on task, I guess. Yeah. Yes. Well, and, and for me, I, I just, I don't want to be a liability. Right. You know? Yes. And I, 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 after losing my own child, I couldn't, I couldn't live with myself knowing that I had contributed to the loss of somebody else's child yes. so when I'm at work I try to be you're on as yeah focused as I possibly can be yes and as attentive to detail as 
as my brain will allow. Yeah. And so far they haven't asked me to leave. So <laughs> I'm hoping it's a good, hoping it's a good sign. Yeah, I think that is a good sign. <laughs> um, well, yeah. Angelica, tell me what you have done in order to kind of remember Ezra. I know you mentioned in your birth story that they gave you a weighted teddy bear. And I think some people don't know about these kind of weighted teddy bears or weighted like stuffed animals where it's the same weight yeah. as your, as your child. Oh, you're going to go grab it. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> so I have two. Oh, look at that. So this is the teddy bear that they gave us in the hospital. Uh-huh. Oh, he's really cute. And, and, um, he actually weighs less than, than Ezra, but it's, it's strange when you're, when you're cradling them in your arms, they just feel so small yeah, and so weightless. And so when I was holding him, I thought to myself that, you know, that they had to be around the same weight, but they aren't, oh. <laughs> they aren't at least not with the, not with the Molly bread that we got later on. And I think this is a brand that's called, this is called the Comfort Cub. Cute. <laughs> um, so that's him. And then this is the. Molly bear that we made. That's and the, it's got his name and everything. That's so cute. Yeah. Has his his metrics on the. Oh, bar. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> is that something that you can have like custom with the um with the Molly yeah. bears? Okay, because we don't have one, and that's I for that was not on our radar because I don't I I did not know <laughs> that there was something you could do like that. And then I started talking to more people. I was like, oh, maybe I should get a Molly bear because like, that would be fun to have something that is his weight kind of has is kind of represents our son. Yeah, when at any point. Yeah. Um my, my mom actually she, she so my mom had a pregnancy loss between my brother and me. Um and uh so that's, you know, 30 30 plus years and yeah. she got a Molly bear. Oh. That's great. Um so how how far along was her loss? I'm I'm curious. She was about 17 weeks along, yeah. but it was the eighties. And so, I mean, in circumstances where maybe a nurse would have offered to let her hold the baby or see the baby, they didn't give her that opportunity. They didn't let her labor. They just, the DNC patched her up and sent her out the door. Yeah. They don't even really know what happened to the baby. Yeah. I don't know. Isn't that just, I, I'm so grateful when I hear stories from different times that I'm like we are a little bit it seems like we get a little bit more chance to be with our child to figure out things to yeah. be able to mourn and grieve um and that it just yeah so grateful that it's a little different than back in the 70s Me or too. you know a different time so that's cool that you're that she was able to get a molly bear too <laughs> I, I think that's great <laughs> um any other things that you guys have to um remember Ezra by yeah, a lot of people have given given me jewelry. Mm -hmm. So I have a ring with his name on it. I don't know if you can see. Oh it. yeah, it's it's a little small, <laughs> but that's okay. Reverse. Yeah. <laughs> um, and bracelets, and then um, I actually I had this necklace made. So, oh look it's at got that. his picture on one side, and then it's oh, got his footprints. I love and that. His name and his date of birth on the other. Look at his cute little footprints. Those are so <laughs> cute. Did you just have that made? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you send the photo files to them, and then they just adjust them to size. That is great. So they can put it on there. Um, and other people have sent us lots of things like that, too, uh, just really thoughtful things. But then we have the things from the hospital mm -hmm. as well. Um, so we have his, his little footprint. Oh, I'm ca I can totally can't <laughs> see that. It's a little too... Oh, it's a little oh I see it there. There like. it is. That's perfect. That's perfect. Okay. Um, and then the hospital gave us, so this is a blanket that they sent for Philippa. Oh, for her. To, for her. And then they also sent her teddy bear. Oh, that's so sweet. And um, and then we have photo books. Like I made this one for Pippa because um, the one that now I lay me down to sleep got for need for us is really big. And oh! Every time she tried to pull it down, I was worried that she was going to give herself a concussion. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> so I made her a little one that has little, of that. Like, oh. little things that you can write on the inside of it. That is so cool. Um, and so, and it's small for small hands. Yeah. So she can reference that. Oh, that, so I'm, so the, the big album is from, uh, um, so I lay me down to sleep. They, that is cool. I didn't realize that they made yeah. albums. Um, it's actually from, I can't remember the name of the company, but they, so it, it, they're contracted through, um, through the hospital. So okay. The hospital kind of links them together. Yeah. Now I lay me down to sleep and then they make, they just make a photo book for you. That is really it's cool. Using the files that they, that they took when they got the photographs in yeah. the hospital. And I, I love, I love having I love having it. Yeah. I really do. Yeah. Oh yeah. That it looks awesome. And, and what a beautiful, like, like kind of just a remembrance being able to flip through those photos yeah. regularly and easily. So I think that's awesome. Yeah. And then they, they make, I, when, when I thought about what I was going to do for a baby book, cause I was thinking about that after the fact, I just broke down and I was, I was looking online and there is a memorial baby book that they think called I love you still. Yes. I have seen that, but I have not, I have not gotten it, but I, and so you can just put, that's, that's Pippa's contribution. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but it has information about you and you can put pictures in what your family looked like before. Oh, that's so and great. And then, it goes month by month, so four months, you know, seven months, and eventually you get to the point where you were when you lost, and so there's just there are blank pages, but it's a way to to you know to kind of include that information, and I feel like it's almost like a self help book too because at the back it's got you know prompts like how have you changed and. <laughs> um, what 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 things have helped you? I am grateful for. I think that's so. You can use it like a a journal too. So. I um um I will share a link to that because I have like I said I that just barely showed up on my radar and I was like oh <laughs> I I uh, might not need to check that out. That is really cool that there's kind of this option to create a baby book in a sense. Yeah, because you would record you would record all those things. And I remember writing him down after we came home from the hospital. It was pretty quick after that I started to write things down just because I could feel the fog starting to set in. And it's still there. You know, I still feel so foggy. But having some of those things in writing yeah. is is helpful. It can help me to jog my memory a little bit and because every time that I feel like those memories are slipping away, I just feel like I'm losing a part of him too. Yeah. And it's just, yeah. it's just hard. Yes. It's just been hard. Yeah. Those memories are, I, writing that down, writing things down has been, has been key for us too. Um, so even if it's just a quick note on my phone, if I remember something, I, I try, we try to do that. Like I, I do that on my phone. My husband, I know that he, he usually keeps a little notes file as well. And so, yeah, I think writing it down as quickly as possible is always super helpful. And then I have actually really enjoyed going back and looking at some of the things that I wrote and I do notice some changes, right? Like you, yeah, yeah, you kind of notice changes in yourself and then also like, oh, I don't remember that. But then now it jogs my memory to of something else that I had felt at the time. So, yeah, so... I've always been horrible about writing, uh -huh. you know, I'd start a journal and then put in a couple of entries <laughs> and then five years later, stumble upon it again. But, um, I was amazed by the number of people who gifted us journals. And yeah. so I thought, okay, maybe I'll start one. <laughs> so I did start writing in a journal. Great. And I figured that, you know, I, I can't, I often can't, you know, write in a, a diary, like let's do diary, you know, <laughs> Because for some reason it just doesn't it doesn't establish a habit for me. Yeah. And so um I've started writing just letters to him. Oh, okay. Letters to Ezra, like I'm talking to him about the day. Yeah. Things that I was thinking about that day, ways that I was thinking about him, the things that reminded me of him. Just like having a conversation with him. Yes. Yeah. That's been helpful too. 
That's awesome. A little bit of um, inclusion in your day. I like I like that a lot. So Nick was, um, you mentioned your husband, Nick. Uh, he was very, how has he handled all of this in this, the last 10 months? He, like me, has just been kind of all over, all over the map because it's just a roller coaster of emotions. It really is. Uh, but to start with, he, he just seemed so strangely serene, you know? Um, I mentioned that when I first, when they first wheeled me into the recovery room mm-hmm. and he, I saw him there holding us, right? He was telling me that another baby had been born and I, I said, I, I started to cry and he said, no, it's okay. I'm grateful that their baby is okay. I'm grateful that everything is okay for them. And he just kept repeating that word for, you know, the, the, subsequent three or four weeks I'm just so grateful and grateful I had a chance to meet him and hold him and, and and as time passed I could tell that he was definitely just trying he was trying to kind of keep it together for me mm-hmm. to a certain extent because he has definitely had his moments where where he needs me to be the strong one or he, he just he needs somebody else's support and I kept telling him not to do that at the very beginning because I knew that he was he was bound to, and I just didn't want him to feel like he had to bear the weight of everything and do all the hard stuff, especially when you're making plans for a funeral. And um, one of the photos that I shared with you is the final draft of Ezra's headstone, and Nick actually designed that. Oh, and so, um you know, just having to do all of these hard things and to not, to not have help and support yourself. I just, I wanted him to know that he didn't have to do that to himself, you know, that he's, he's worthy of having help too. Yeah. I, I'm actually a little curious about if Nick, um, how the process of designing Ezra's headstone was for him. I, uh, my husband and I designed our, uh, we, we actually got a little bench, um, for, our son and I found it strangely therapeutic t- to do that because it it was like I would be you know setting up a crib for him or you know doing something it, f- it felt like a a thing I could do for him like I was going to create something and so I, I'm I, I'd just be curious to know if Nick felt some sort of like hey I'm doing something for my son like I'm making him something you know like I'm just interesting you know, I had never, I've never asked him that specifically, but I know that after he would, after he would have, you know, a couple of hours of work on, on the design, he would, he would seem like he was pretty emotionally depleted. Really? You know? Yeah. Um, but it came out so lovely, you know, it just, I can't help but think of it as a labor of, of love. Yeah. On yeah. his part. Yeah, for sure. I that's that's really cool that he did that. I cuz that is I'll be honest, I was totally checked out that fog had set in when we were planning funeral stuff and I was so grateful for Lee cuz he really just like I said he I felt like he stepped up and he was like I got to take care of this. I got to take care of my family and this is the way I'm going to take care of my family mm-hmm. as best as possible and so sounds like Nick is has, was that way as well. Yeah. yeah it, it is amazing. Oh my gosh. It's amazing. Just how the shock affects you. Mm-hmm. There, there are so many beautiful things that I've heard other parents have done for their kids. And I think to myself, that's an obvious one. Why didn't I do that mm-hmm. too? Like for example, at, at Ezra's funeral, there were no flowers. It was June, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I didn't even think about the fact that there should have been flowers. Some people said that they played music. I didn't, my head just was not there. Yeah. And I don't know why. Well, I mean, and when was the last time you planned a funeral, Angelica? Like really, I mean, <laughs> it's, it, it just is, you just, you don't ever think you're going to be planning a funeral, at, you know, at, at our age. Right. Oh. I just, so I, why would you know 
to get flowers. The only reason why we had flowers for our son was because my mother-in-law said, usually you get some flowers. And I'm like, oh, okay, we'll order some flowers. Like somebody had to tell me what to do. And I was grateful for that because I, like you said, I just didn't have a head on my shoulders at that time. I was completely out of it. It's not like we didn't have flowers. We had a house full of flowers. Yeah. I think before all of this, we had one boss that would disappear every single time that we needed it. Now I have a closet full of it <laughs> and I uh-huh. <laughs> almost kind of can't stand having flowers in a vase in my house just because of how many flowers that were. It's almost a triggering thing for yeah. me. But I could have gathered together any one of those and had like, you know, a big bouquet for his funeral and the brain just was not there. <laughs> Oh, it, that I think it is completely understandable. It's completely understandable. So I am curious if you have had, if somebody did something for you or said anything to you that was like, you want to remember that. And, and it was so you, you really appreciated what they said or what they did for you in the last 10 months. The very, so that morning, the morning that Ezra was born, we were sitting in the hospital room and flowers arrived. And um, I don't have the butterfly. The butterfly is somewhere else. But it was this arrangement from downstairs. And it had a butterfly on it and it had a card. And it was from the neonatologists and nurse practitioners on my floor because they knew what had happened. It's not like I had told anybody, yeah. but they knew, they knew what had happened and they cared enough to send me something to say, we understand the sucks. Yeah. And, um, and since then, so many people have done the same, you know, they've brought food and, and I am, I feel like I am eternally indebted to so many people. The list just is too long for me to really pinpoint any one particular person because I just felt so much love and support in a time when when that kind of thing feels nigh on impossible with with a pandemic and with with the concerns that you have of potentially making somebody else sick Mm -hmm. you know people who who would come up and look at me and say, I've got a mask on, you've got a mask on, can I give you a hug? Oh. You know? um, and just, I think one thing I remember is that I hadn't, I hadn't been hugged by anybody other than my husband and my right. daughter for months. Right. I got more hugs in the couple of days following my son's death than I had from January, February on. Yeah. I mean, it, it was just just that, that human that human touch that I had forgotten was so necessary. <laughs> and and there they were when I needed them. And there were so many people who showed up who I haven't talked to in ages. But they offered to make food and take my daughter to the park and sit with me and cry with me and you know like I like I was saying with my coworkers, you know sacrifice their their own time off so that I had a couple of extra weeks to pull myself together and determine whether or not I was going to be able to go back to work and now I feel like I have no choice (laughs) (laughs) because you know how could I how could I leave some place full of so many wonderful amazing human beings yeah Uh, I just feel so grateful just despite the awful nature of of the the experience itself I feel so grateful to have so many people in my life who love me it just gives you this this renewed faith in humanity (laughs) yes that is a perfect way of putting it actually (laughs) because yeah we felt uh, yeah, the, just the love, like we just felt so cared for and loved. It sounds like you had, you have had a similar experience, which is very, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. 
and just hearing people wanting to talk about him, mm-hmm. you know, even those really awkward, sometimes triggering things that people say, mm-hmm. regardless of how many of those I've encountered, I just, I find that anybody who is willing to, to talk about him with me, I just, I appreciate them so much. Yeah. Because I know that when you're talking about a stillborn baby, um, it's it's kind of a conversation stopper. <laughs> but anybody who looks at you and says, Tom Moore, or I get ya, you know, you can talk talk about him anytime or call me anytime that you're having a really rough go of it. Those people, those people who reach out to help when you have no clue what to do. When the only, the only thing that you can say is, "What do I do next?" Because I, I think, that was the the question just cycling in my brain, for, you know, in the hours and and weeks following Ezra's death, I was just thinking to myself, "What, what now? What do I do now?" You know, I just need somebody to tell me what I need to do, because I can't make those decisions. Yeah. Or, or I can't make this, I can't determine what needs to be done on my own anymore. My brain just is not there anymore. Yeah, that's, <laughs> you say that and I was like, oh yeah, that's exactly how I was. I could not wrap my brain around things that I needed to do. Like, uh, yeah, thank goodness for people that kind of kept our lives together for those months after yeah it's just so traumatizing it's just so traumatizing is there you have mentioned that people have said some awkward things obviously is there anything that maybe is not the best thing to say to a lost mom that that maybe has rubbed you a little wrong I I don't want you to call anybody out I don't want you to (laughs) um uh, yeah I don't want you to call anybody out but if there's anything that because I know that people just want to know what to say, right? They just want to know what to say. And they they kind of want to know what to not to say, I think, um, so that it just makes it, like, not so awkward, I guess. <laughs> to start with, like, at the, at the very beginning, I really struggled with religious platitudes. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, mm-hmm. like, God has a plan for everything. And, you know, there's, there, there's a reason for everything. Just because I... My husband and I, we were were raised Catholic, but we haven't been practicing. Mm -hmm. And so there was just a part of me that just couldn't wrap my head around this idea that, that there was, you know, at the moment that there was, there was a reason for his death. And I just, it, it, that, that, that stung a little bit, but I think as time has passed, that's, that's become less triggering, but initially it was extremely triggering. Um, and then just anybody talking about, you know, somebody else's pregnancy or somebody else's baby really close on, you know, really close to the loss itself. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember there was a friend of mine who came in and she's very sweet and asked her how she was doing. Cause she'd asked me how I was doing. I was just trying to normalize things in the days after we got home from the hospital and she said, oh, you know, things are good. And she was talking to me about a a mutual friend of ours, she said, yeah, but I'm not going to see them for a couple of weeks because um, they're going into quarantine for for about two or three weeks before their baby's born. But that baby, the, the baby's due like early June or something like that, yeah. and, or early July, early July or something like that. Um, Ezra was due on July 15th yeah, and his C-section was scheduled for July 9th. And I just <sighs> fell apart. <laughs> I just fell apart. So uh, I think that just talk, talking talking about babies and pregnancy in general can be kind of triggering, but I think it's so hard. It's just so, so hard. And I, I feel like anybody who is even willing to, to try mm-hmm. should be given grace. Yeah. Because because they're willing to they're willing to enter that awkward zone with you, knowing that you know that not any not everything they say is going to feel just right yeah and for every person it's so different 
but I think the thing that helps the most is just all of those those comments that are validating you know like giving giving those people the space to talk about what they're feeling and thinking and then and then saying yeah it does suck yes this is hard yes I hear you and, and just confirming that they're not alone yeah the validating and the confirming of your feelings and uh because I think sometimes we're so apt to you know, like you mentioned before, you kind of push away those feelings or you sweep them under the rug or you just kind of push them away. Like, I'm not sad. I'm not angry. I'm not all of these things. I'm not depressed. I'm not anxious, whatever. We, we have, a we have these feelings. We, and to have somebody say, yeah, this really is hard and this is horrible and this is devastating. That, that helps us, that helps me emotionally when somebody validates what I'm feeling. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. (laughs) There's this book that um, that one of our friends gave us. Actually, it was a whole family. They pulled together and they got a book and then they got a little bunny rabbit for for Pippa. It looks like the bunny rabbit on the book. It's called The Rabbit Listened. Um, And it's it's the story about this little boy who had built up this tower with blocks. And then this you know, this flock of, of black birds came down and and knocked it down and he's just sitting in the ruins of this beautiful thing. And various animals are coming through and, you know, the bear says, I want to be angry about it. You know, let's be angry. But you know, the little boy doesn't say anything because he doesn't want to be angry at that point. And so it just goes through these animals. At the end, it has this little bunny rabbit who just is there. And then just comes and sits next to the little boy quietly until the little boy is ready to say something. And then eventually the little boy does want to be angry and the little boy does you know, want to talk about what he remembers and he does want to be sad and he does want to hide. And But the little rabbit is just sitting there just listening. And so it's, it's a good reminder to me too to be that for the other people in my life because I'm not the only one who lost someone. You know, my my parents and Nick's parents, they lost a grandchild, our siblings, they lost a nephew and, you know, our close friends. We, we always refer to them as aunts and uncles and they may as well have lost a nephew as well. And, and they all have really complex feelings around it. And so, you know, knowing that you can be together in it, even though you're not experiencing things the same way that you can be together in it helps so much yeah that grace that you give um, others as well is that's really important yeah so important because yeah I it's it's really easy to forget that there have uh, there are other people that lost someone important to them too yeah yeah (laughs) oh that that just made me remind me of my um, in-laws who are they love they love our son so, so much and they have expressed that. So that's a good, that's a good reminder. This has been a really wonderful conversation and I really appreciate all that you've said and shared with us. Is there any last bit of advice that you would like to share with either somebody that is going through this right now, or maybe somebody that's supporting a lost mom or a lost dad? A lost parent, I would say just be gentle with yourself. There is no wrong way to grieve. And and I think for, for anybody, anybody who parent who's lost a baby or somebody who's trying to support them, to reach out. Just continue to continue to reach out for those for those resources, for those people who can help you. There are so many wonderful ways that you can help each other through it. Um, and you know, when you're ready, those resources will be there. You don't have to go to a support group right away. Uh, you don't have to start searching for other lost parents, trying to ground yourself right away. But when the day comes that you feel like you're ready, they'll be there. Those organizations will be there. And, and there are actually support groups for families 
for, for, for family members. Um, one of them is through the support, the sorry, the Star Legacy Foundation. They have a, a monthly meeting for parents, you know, uh, grandparents, aunts, uncles, friends, people who just want to be there. And, and so, you know, just keep reaching out because we're as lonely as this feels. We're not alone. Thank you so much, Angelica. That was some very good advice.